My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are delighted to be here with all of you and our partners at the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American culture and history. We are so, so, so excited to be celebrating this book, Do the Work, an anti-racist activity book. We're here with W. Kamau Bell and Kate Schatz and with Alicia Garza, three people who we admire, whose work we love, and who are gonna show you a good time, an informative time, and um, we hope that you're gonna come out of here with some actionable things and take the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so I wanna first introduce Alicia Garza. Alicia believes that black communities deserve what all communities deserve, to be powerful in every aspect of their lives. An author, political strategist, organizer, and cheeseburger enthusiast, Alicia founded the Black Futures Lab to make black communities powerful in politics. She is the co-creator of the hashtag Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter Global Network. She serves as the Strategy and Partnerships Director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and she is the co-founder of Supermajority, a new home for women's activism. Alicia has become a powerful voice in the media and frequently contributes thoughtful opinion pieces and expert commentary on politics, race, and more to outlets such as MSNBC and the New York Times. She has received numerous accolades and recognitions, including being on the cover of Time's 100 Most Influential People in the World and being named to Bloomberg's 50 and Politico's 50 lists. She is the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart. And she warns you, hashtags don't start movements, people do. So please welcome Alicia Garza. And next I'd like to introduce Kate Schatz. She is an author, activist, educator, and queer feminist mama who's been talking, writing, and teaching about race, gender, and social justice and equity for many years. She's the New York Times best-selling author of the Rad Women book series, which includes Rad American Women A to Z, Rad American Women Worldwide, Rad Girls Can, and Rad American History A to Z, all of which are available in the lobby. And her book of fiction, Rid of Me, A Story, is part of the cult favorite 33rd and a 3rd series. Along with W. Kamau Bell, she is the co-author of the book we're here to celebrate tonight, Do the Work. We invite you to give a warm welcome to Kate Schatz. <laughs> and finally, we're here to celebrate W. Kamau Bell, who is a dad, husband, and comedian. He directed and executive produced the four-part Showtime documentary, We Need to Talk About Cosby, which premiered at Sundance. He famously met with the KKK on his Emmy-winning, award-winning CNN docuseries, United States of America with W. Kamau Bell, where he serves as host and executive producer. He has appeared on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. <laughs> So the last thing I gotta say is we want y'all to ask questions. The mic is over here, so when Alicia is done and invites you to ask questions, you're gonna pop up over here and ask them. Thank you all so much for being here. Hey, thank you. Can we give a shout out? <laughs> all right, so hey y'all. Hey. 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 All right. I know, right? <laughs> so, um, before we start tonight, uh, I do want to just thank you for coming out on a Tuesday night. I know you got a lot of things to do, but we're here to do the work, so we're going to prioritize this. And we want to thank you for coming out during a pandemic. I mean, we don't be all right. And we tried to schedule this in between variants, you know, just to make sure <laughs> we were going to be okay. Rona invited her cousins, and we didn't know, but that's all right. That's all right. We're going to make it. A uh, big thank yous to Auburn Avenue Research Library for hosting us tonight. Can we give a shout out? <laughs> and then also big gratitude to Kate and Kamau for allowing us to do a simultaneous recording of my podcast, Lady Don't Take No. So make some noise so all the listeners can hear you. So I, I always 
always just want to jump in, and I started off talking about a pandemic, and that seems controversial still these days. I'm not really sure why. Why is it controversial to say that we're still in a pandemic? We are. Thank you for wearing your mask. Um, but I do want to ask you, what has your pandemic life been like? I mean, look, we got Rona. She brought her cousins and her in-laws. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know about this. And now we're all just trying to live in the same house and like get along. So what has your pandemic life been like? Kay, why don't you start off? Tell us, what's it been like? And have you developed any unique habits live and direct from Miss Rona? OK, I'm not going to lie. I listen to your podcast every week and it got me through yes. the panorama thank you and so like <laughs> have i practiced my answers to the exact question these exact questions yes i have you have yes, yes. yeah do i remember yes. the super witty cool not. answers like no i don't remember not. but uh <laughs> my pandemic life has at this point it feels like it's been a bunch of different lives you know there's it's been going on for a long time you know there was the part where my kids weren't at school, oh, yeah, that part. <laughs> the part where they were at home, uh -huh. that, that, that felt like it took a million years. Uh -huh. uh, there was the part where we were writing this book together. You know, um, the, Kamau was really the only person I saw outside of my immediate family in person for almost a full year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's what makes our book so good. Um, but also, uh, I mean, I went through a lot of personal transformation during the, during the pandemic, too. So there was a whole part where I was getting a divorce and having my new partner. Just that part. Yeah, Shout my new partner, my ladies. new partner moving in and That's restarting my life yeah, no, and transforming was... everything. Do you so understand me? I did a lot. Okay, so we have been yeah. connecting like telepathically clearly yeah. through ladies love notes, obviously. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a, I'm a listener. Okay. Yeah, long time listener, first Divorces time talker. Divorces unite mm -hmm. and yes. I definitely have to hear about this new round, you uh -huh. know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. It, it yeah. happened a little fast for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the divorce to the new partner, but okay. I, okay. I've accepted it. Thank you. I like thank Lauren you. a lot. Yeah, thank Let's you. Go. Well, she was around for a long time. Anyway, I got to oh, say her name. I got to say hi to Lauren because she's really a little listener. <laughs> and, and I, don't I feel like you guys don't need me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming, Kamau. Yes. It's been so nice. Now, stage left. <laughs> <laughs> and, and wait, I have to answer my did I develop any new habits live and direct from Miss Rona. Um, I, I actually, though it's been tested, I think I developed um, a new way to be patient with my children. You know what? That is a superpower. Yes. Legit. It's been tested superpower. many times. I'm but with this. I developed new strategies for that. I'm with this. Okay, so we're gonna come back to all of this. There was so much juiciness in yeah. there. Part two. Now you got me feeling like Wendy Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Wendy. How you doing? <laughs> okay, come out. Uh, what has your quarantine life been like? And tell me about some new habits you've developed, live and direct, from Miss Rona and her homie Pox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, um, hmm. I, I, I think I, I messed up during the quarantine, uh, that I thought that things were going to be quiet for a lot longer. So I started up a bunch of new things because I was like, I'm not going to be traveling. <laughs> like, clearly, we're not going to be traveling. So we started this book. And I started a couple other things. And then that October, CNN was like, time to go back on the road. No. I was like, but we didn't. There's no vaccine. Oh, my contract. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to see airports that were empty and everybody was running for everybody and yeah. face shields. I mean, that was me. All the way, th I've gotten to see the whole, like the country through the airports the whole way through to now I'm like, man, we just back, back to regular, huh? Just no oh, big deal. Oh. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely like, the last two years of my life, and I was just reflecting on this recently, it's the 10 year, recently it was the 10 year anniversary of my first TV show, Totally Biased. Shout out. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Uh, the little show that didn't. Uh, <laughs> thank you, that's why it was canceled. Uh, <laughs> even in a room of 14 people, only three people knew it is. Uh, but yeah, so, and, and so it's really been like, this is the first, like now that the book is out, it feels like a huge like, okay, there's like a little bit of like a breath that I can take now. Mm -hmm. So me and my family just took like a, our first trip to Martha's Vineyard, Yo. Uh, where we got to see the, like I know Atlanta has fancy blacks, but <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not comparing and contrasting. I'm just saying that like, that's like a fancy black convention. You know what, my name is Bennett and I ain't in it. I'm new here. So okay, yeah, no, I'm just saying it's trouble. like a convention of fancy black folks there. <laughs> and it was just like this real like, like my kids and my wife were there and it was just this real like there's just a like a level of of sort of like a level of like a concentrated level it's weird it's martha vineyard an island a concentrated level of black excellence that 
even though living in Oakland and being in Atlanta that I'm not that I that I'm not used to being around. Yeah. And it was just it was really like spiritually refreshing in a way that I was not prepared for. Yeah. Like one night we went to the beach and there was a it's here's the thing, there's a bunch of black people on the beach, but it's not the black beach. <laughs> some people know what I'm talking about. And you just and you're just there and at some point some reverend's like, All right everybody, let's circle up and pray and I was like, I guess we're doing this yeah. now. <laughs> That's exactly what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Like, what would be the, the dude from CNN who's like, nah. You bet not. <laughs> so, you yes. You bet and, not. And, and so there was a level of, like, recently there was a level of, like, refresh and spiritual refresh that I was not anticipating that I have really, that I really appreciated. Yeah. I love this. I love this. There's so much to talk about. I was telling y'all earlier, I was on Martha's Vineyard when Charlottesville happened. Needless to say, I haven't been back since. <laughs> you felt like, I gotta go. I was like, I feel like I'm in a real live rendition of Get Out, and I don't want that, actually. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. I also wasn't in the Oak Bluff side. I was at the other That's side. That's what you learned about the Oak Bluffs where the black people are. You were in the side of town. We don't have to mention it, but. Uh, That's how I learned about the sides. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, it's really. I wasn't on the right it's side. It's really strange. It's a little bit like the TV show Lost. Correct. Where there's like, oh, the others live over here. Correct. Except it's the black others. Correct. Like, oh, I think I'm going to hang out with the black others instead Correct. of you people over here running away from polar bears. Yeah. And yeah. you have limited options of getting on and off. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very, it's very, it's funny. There's this sort of this, like, I, it's a, reminding me a little bit, and it is an island, so it reminded me a little bit. I couldn't help but think about Hawaii <laughs> where, as an island yep. where people, because the people of Martha's Vineyard who, there are native Hawaiians, and there are people of Martha's Vineyard who would say they're natives, but they're not natives. <laughs> they're in the Don't way they, start they're the mess. <laughs> And then I think about the Sea Islands off of South Carolina where black folks basically, t once slavery was ended, they were like, white people leave. And, Legit. you know, and so, like, we're able to re retain a lot of the West African culture yep. and language yep. and, and develop their own language. And just that sense of, like, when we're left to our own devices and we can relax, things feel a lot different. Mm. Mm. Did you see Obama? No, I, I, I think he, I heard, I, I got there, I, I know he showed up at Questlove's thing, but I did not see him. I did go to a place that had an Obama burger, so I did, but I didn't order it. <laughs> did you get any um, passes because people thought you were Quest? Okay, so here's the thing. This is <laughs> you so, know I had to ask. You know I had to ask. You first of all, <laughs> Ms. Garza, I get some passes for being W. Kamau Bell, first fair, of all. Fair enough, fair enough. I, yeah, fair so enough. let's. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. As if, as if you were not saying, but yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> no, here's the thing that's painful for me. People get me in Quest confused all the time. I've learned to accept it, but it's painful when black people do it. <laughs> it's pain. One guy was like, hey, what's up, Q-Love? Oh, so you know me well enough to abbreviate it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you don't know it's me? You don't know who he is? Yeah. So, and he, and apparently it's happened to him a lot too because it makes me feel better. I thought it was just because I was the less famous one, but apparently it happens to him too. But it, when it's black people, it just feels like, mm. <laughs> mm. You know he don't let people call him Q-Love. You know no, no, exactly. You know, Q-Love. You know. you that you didn't really work know. on me. I know it don't work on him. Listen, it's a fact. All right, so look, we're about to get into a whole conversation about what it means to do the work. But I was thinking about this on the way over here. I mean, we keep having all these conversations about how polarized this country is. And then we go, how did we get here? Like it's a new phenomenon. Lots of us know America's been polarized for a very long time. And it makes us feel better to think that we're not. And there's also been a whole lot of like pushes since 2020 perhaps, maybe even a little bit earlier, that was like we have to understand where people are coming from. Understand where the conspiracy theories and the misinformation and the disinformation and the, you know, kids locked in a basement below a pizza joint that thing doesn't have a basement. comes from. So I, I wanna find a middle ground here in the spirit of my friend who shall not be named. I wanna find common ground. And I wanna ask, talk to me about a time when you felt really, really, really strongly about something you were convinced this is right, this is the way it is, and you changed your mind. What happened? That's a good question. Oh, I thank you. That's probably the hardest question anybody's ever asked. This is what it means to do the work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I would say this, that. like, 
I'm, I'm not the kind of person, and maybe this is known from how my career goes, who's going to be like, you don't know what you talk. That's not, that's just not. No, you sat down with the clan. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, it's not, like, it's not in me to be that sort of like, <laughs> well, you don't ever. Uh, I will just quietly see is how I go. That's mm. how I go. But, uh, so, but I will, so I'll say this, moving from Chicago in 1997, I was 24 years old, I know, uh, I was 24, and I moved to, I moved to the Bay Area to do, I moved, specifically I was moving to San Francisco to do comedy, because uh, it's a great stand-up comedy scene. And I was 24, and I ended up working, living in Oakland, and working in Berkeley, like at one of the school supply stores. Mm. And just that, instead of living in San Francisco, I ended up sort of comedy, doing comedy at nights in San Francisco, working in Berkeley, living in Oakland. So that's like a little triangle that a lot of people in the Bay Area don't get. And as much as it all sounds like the Bay Area, maybe, it's like, it's not, yeah. They're islands. They're islands, yes. Uh, and so I got to see lots of different types of people and, and just sort of got to be, like, through osmosis, just like, be around things like, I don't know if that's right. But then just being around enough to be like, I guess it's okay. Mm. So I, for me, it was really a sense of like just being in rooms with lots of different types of people and hearing things that I didn't agree with or thought were confusing or thought were, didn't make any sense. And then over time being like, well, they haven't been struck by lightning by God yet, so I guess it must be good. You know? And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but just the idea being that like what I thought was weird or strange and I mean, we could go. I mean, we can go down from like. I mean, you know, in Chicago, I think I knew one openly gay person, you yeah. know, and it was that's Angie. She's a lesbian. <laughs> you had to whisper. Yeah, yeah, that, and every all the and all the dudes. That's she's no, no, don't even. She's she's a lesbian. Don't you can't even really talk to her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. To like all the way to suddenly being in the Bay Area, where it's like it's not. It's to if you only know one, it's you. You find out you're not a nice person. Correct. So, you know, so the idea being that, like, I just sort of, like, so there'd be ideas of, like, whether it's, like, issues of, like, gayness or how gayness is, or how this, how gay people are out with their gayness or how they are with each other or going to the Folsom Street Fair where everybody's naked with their <laughs> yeah, balls wrapped sorry. up in a thing. Yeah, and you're just like, and it's like, <laughs> I paid $9 to see this. <laughs> like, just sort of being around these things that you sort of just, that you just sort of go, I sort of take it in and over time just like, huh. And down to like, I mean, and probably the, la the biggest one for me, and this has been in the last 10 years, is like under starting to really understand, or not understand, starting to really investigate my understanding of, of the trans identity, mm -hmm. you know, of people who are trans. Shout out to you. Dave and Chappelle seems to have missed this point. I said it, what? He missed it. I could have said other things, I was being <laughs> nice. And, I, and so for me, when I hear people who don't understand it, I feel like a lot of this is like an indicator of like, oh, you're not really like out in these streets. You're not out here just because if you just are, because this is the way it happens with most stuff. If you're just around people, I mean, I think New York City is a great example of that, of like, they're like people are just around all sorts of different types of people. And so all they care about is that that guy runs a good bodega on oh. some level. They're not worried about who he's praying to oh. or, you know, at, at, its, at, its, at its most basic. Oh. And so for me, I think that like, you know, so I'm and every every so often like I, like Kelly, you know Kelly, who I yeah, work with. Kelly, Kelly Rafferty is like on business. the leading edge of like of like just like a lot of a lot of like feminist thought. And so that sometimes I'll say something to be like, "Well, Kamal, if you say it like that, it's going to sound like a fat phobic." Mm. I'm like fat phobic. Mm. Look at me, I'm I can I can you know, yes. and then sort of and then she will be like, "Ba ba 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 ba," and I'm like, "Huh." And at the time, that huh is not saying, I totally agree and it, makes, and it totally makes sense to me. It's like, huh, I'm gonna sit with that for a little while. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna hear more, and I'm gonna, and you're gonna send me some links, and I'm gonna look those things up, and yeah. I'm gonna pay more attention. And over time, I will sort of, so it's really like, to me, the, the, stance is, uh, uh, the stance is not initially, I mean, I think as a kid, it was like, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. but it was, but its stance is like, I don't know anything about that. Let me just sit with it for a minute. Mm. So, I, so for me, I can't really think of, especially in the last, so I'd say since 94, I have a hard time thinking of sometimes I was like, I was on the opposite side of somebody. It mostly was like, I don't know what you're talking about, so I'm going to be quiet. Mm. Mm. And even if I don't agree with you, I'm going to be quiet. That's powerful. That's a start, right? I mean, what you're talking about is growth, right? Which is ideally a thing that we're all doing <laughs> all the time. And I think what's so great about that question, Alicia, is that I think it gets to what we talk about a lot in the book, you know, because people are, one of the questions we get a lot is, you know, how do I talk to my racist so-and-so, whether it's your uncle, your neighbor, your high school friend. Your governor. You know, how do I, <laughs> and it, but you're right, you're governor. 
you know. Yeah, I'm sorry, your current governor. <laughs> yes, <laughs> temporary. Uh, but you know, but like, how do you, how do I get so and so to change their mind? Yeah. You know, how do I get so and so to change their mind about X? And one of my, I mean, I, I there's a lot of people that I want to change their minds about X, but then I always think about it in terms of like, well, would I change my mind? What would it take to get me to change my mind about what I believe about? Uh, the right to bodily autonomy and an abortion. Who's going to change? My, that's not going to change, right? Mm -hmm. So I, that is the way I've always tried to approach thinking about change mm -hmm. and change making is how deep-seated my beliefs are and, and what would it take to get me to, mm -hmm. to shift. And I don't think it's so much, for a lot of people, it's not about changing a mind entirely or like completely flipping an ideology, yep. right? It's about how we grow and how we understand and how we accept things that are new. Mm -hmm. So I think my, my answer is I had time to think because you did a nice long answer, so I got to think about it. <laughs> that was a um, way for her to you, say, you, you talked too much. No, no. You saw that, no, right? It was perfect. You saw that, right? She said you did a nice no, long answer. I appreciated answer. it. <laughs> you always do come out. <laughs> no. That was another one of your classic nice long answers. He, he shares the airtime very well. Thank you. Uh, no, you know what it made me think of is, uh, I don't think this is so much me changing my mind, but more of me understanding and growing. And um, I think uh, I'm a like a big time know-it-all, and I think I always have been. I ask my mom, she would verify that. Virgo, know-it-all. Shout out yeah. Capricorn, yeah. same thing. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, but I think that there was a time early on in my early 20s, um, and I think I was, in, I was involved in a lot of kind of social justice and activism work. I went to UC Santa Cruz. I grew up in the Bay Area. Yep. I grew up very steeped in a lot of this, and I was like, anti-racist and I was a feminist and I was all these things and uh, but I didn't understand my whiteness and I didn't understand my position as a white woman in the space I took up and I had a lot of assumptions about what I knew and a lot of it was it was not based on lived experiences because I lived and I worked and I went to school in predominantly white institutions and it wasn't until I graduated from undergrad and I moved to Oakland and I got a job where I was the only white person um, on a large staff of, yeah. of educators and dancers and performers yep. And that was a huge shift for me. Um, and it didn't make me, it didn't flip the way I understood everything necessarily, but being the only white person in this space, having, having bosses for the first time in my life, having a boss who was black, mm -hmm. um, having all these colleagues, um, mm -hmm. having everybody I was working with um, was, was, was black or Latino, uh, that sh really started to shift. It basically, I mean, it's like, you know, theory and practice, right? Yeah. Like all these ideas that I had from my like great college education and all these lofty ideals I had were really like actually something I was like, finally living. So I think that was a big shift for me. I love that. I can, can, I, can I give, I know my answer was long, but can, can I add an <laughs> Of course, of course. Because I just realized there's a thing that recently happened. So this past weekend on United Shades, we did an episode about the land back movement, mm -hmm. indigenous people in this country. I who were, it. it was good. Oh, it, was, we were, it, were, it was excellent. This season we're doing some things. Mm. Uh, and, it, and so I would say that the uh, first blush hearing indigenous people want the land back, you start thinking about, does that mean my house? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was certainly a response I had in and of myself when I heard land back. I mean, I support all your issues, but is there a carve out for my house? You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so for me, that was my reaction. And then I sort of had this moment of like, and this is why it's so great for me to do the show, of like, why don't you listen to what they're saying? Mm -hmm before you start to do like this. And all over online, I've been tweeting about it all the last week, I can see people like, that doesn't make any sense because of blah, 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 blah. And it's like, oh, yeah, you didn't you read didn't the, watch the You didn't show. watch the thing, you didn't read the article. Yeah, you, I linked to an article, somebody was like, I don't know, what, did you do this? Could you read the article? I'm not gonna read the article, okay. <laughs> okay, right. well, what then, are we we're, talking then we're done about? talking, then Correct. we're done talking. So for Correct. me, but that's a classic example of like, hearing that sounds like, uh, it's, I'm perceiving it initially as a threat to me, and it's like, well, why don't you read up on it and learn about it? And one of the great things that came out of it was because I get to do the show and fly around and talk to people. I talked to Nick Tilson and Crystal Tubles of the Indian Collective, and they both said basically, like, if you're assuming that we're going to do to you, the colonizer, what you did to us, that's the wrong assumption. Correct. And it was like, oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that, and, and also the assumption is like, we're going to take, we want the land back because we're going to take better care of it than you are, people who are bringing polio back. Hello? Like, we wouldn't be bringing polio back. So the idea being that, like, that's a great example. Of, like, as soon as I heard it, I support, I support indigenous activists. It all, I went to, got to go to Standing Rock. But that's the thing that initially made me go like this, just because I didn't know what I was, they were talking about mm -hmm. until I actually did the reading, mm. as they say. I love y'all. Okay. Uh, I love you. We have so much to talk about. 
And in a little bit, we're going to do a lightning round that's going to really up this energy a little bit. But I just want to start by giving a shout out to this. Do y'all have this? It's pretty fresh. It's pretty fresh. So, um, you know, I got this inquiry from two people I really like. They happen to be named W. Kamau Bell and Kate Schatz. They were like, hey, would you write the intro? And I was like, what is, is this some like, what is this? What's happening? And the person's like, well, it wasn't, it's not written yet. Right, and, and you know, we're, we're all from the Bay, so you have to understand, this is common. These are yeah. common conversations. But one of the things that I really, really appreciated about this, and you were describing it to me, and I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. I'm saying yes because I love y'all. Then I got this thing in the mail, baby. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, these are things I could do on conference calls. These are things I could do with my nieces and nephews. I want to color in this book. I want to pull all the things out. Oh, and I'm also reading what you have to say. You start off by saying, this book is for white people. I was like, well now, y'all just want to jump in like that? I mean, how did you decide that this was necessary and why did you make that really bold statement? This book is for white people. I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, okay. now you know good I mean, well we gonna start with you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'll take it. Well, so here's the thing, and as we've, we've answered that question a lot, and I think there's a lot of ways we can answer it that are all true, you know, but one of the things I've been saying and think a lot about is uh, most books are for white people. Most media is for white people. Mm -hmm. And in the, the, the industries, the publishing industry pretends that's not the case, mm -hmm. kind of, right? Um, but when, they're t when, when, when big publishers, we, you know, we got a nice book deal, we got a good publisher, there's, you know, it's, a, it's a whole thing. And every publisher in 2020 wanted an anti-racist book on their, on their list. Everybody wanted to check that box and yeah, make sure did. that they had the book, right? Because that's what was on the bestseller list and that's what was selling at the time. And, and that's the reality of these industries. So I think part of it, just coming out and saying this book is for white people, felt like you know, getting ahead of the question, right? It felt like, let's just put it out there and say, like, again, this is, this is what books are gonna be fucking aimed at anyway. Yeah. Um, and then we're gonna say, it's also for all kinds of other folks, but when it comes to talking about dismantling white supremacy and figuring out how to talk about racism, like, it's white people that we need to be talking to and who need to be doing this work and who need to be talking about it. Um, I mean, I think as we've been happy to, to realize, like, all along, and you've been referenced a lot as we've been putting this book together, and Kamal will say, like, I want, you know, so-and-so to open it up and learn a lot, but I want Alicia Garza to be able to pick it up and be like. Yeah, but by the way, so-and-so is, I want my white mother-in-law to pick it up and be like, oh, my goodness, well, well whew, oh, all right, okay. And I want you to be like, all right, this is the same reaction you had, that we were always in that, like, Oakland frame of mind of, like, thinking about who, like, the person who, who needs it, who has no, who has never been talked to this way before, and the person, people like you who read it and go, maybe feel like finally somebody's getting through to these people in a way that maybe that other work could not. Mm -hmm. And again, this is not meant to supplant all the other work. It's your book is a reference in this in here. All these other books, the New Jim Crow, yeah. you know, how, how to be an anti-racist. These are all necessary books, but sort of the argument being that like, these are all ways to dismantle structural and systemic racism. Mm -hmm. there's, there's also a way that we, and it's hard to escape, but we, use a collective pronoun all the time to be like, we need to talk about race, mm. right? Like, okay, yeah, but like, what is that we? And that's like why we wrote the book. It, the conversation, the book is a conversation between Kamau and I because, in part, because that's fun, and it's really the conversation we were having, but also like, we're not gonna write as we. There's not, this is, we have really different experiences with yeah. this. So this idea that like, hey everybody, let's all talk about this as if we're all one kind of unified group having one same experience with race and racism, that's not accurate. So let's really name who really needs to talk about it. And that's, again, I think it's yet another thing that white people are not used to, is being like, this is, this is for you. Um, I mean, we're used to a lot of things being for us, <laughs> but they're usually like really great things, <laughs> not, yeah. not, not challenging um, criticism. And I think for me, it's also about like how United Shades works. I'm aware that the core audience of CNN is, is basically like older white people, mm -hmm. and yet I'm not, I'm regularly in the show not talking to those people. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which the book is written where like, this is for, this is for this group, this is for this group, mm -hmm. this is for me and you, and, that, and I do that whether it's stand-up or the book, to be clear about, because I don't, 
want some black person to pick this up and see you don't understand racism be like who is this mother <laughs> <laughs> and so if we say at the top of the book look a most a lot of this is going to be for white people but there's also but you are we believe that no matter who you are you're going to find stuff in here if then if you see something that tells you something you think is basic you're like well that part's not for me right but it doesn't mean that you pick necessarily picked up a book that is, doesn't have anything for you well here's what i really love about this book and also yes because we're tired of talking about it. We tired of talking. We talk about race all the time. We're like, can we just not? We just trying to live. We just trying to function, as we say in the Bay. You know, we just trying to function. Is this like a personal? Okay. Anyways, I get it. We just trying to function. But for a lot of us, we went through this. Well, twice now in the last decade, we went from all lives matter. <laughs> you love Michael Jordan, you take that personally, don't you? I, I actually do. Yeah. To Black Lives Matter, long live George Floyd. I got my sign in my window, you know, my neighborhood. It's like, love is love, Black Lives Matter, science is real. I'm like, I am the only black person in this neighborhood. This is really deep. What does this mean? And now we're kind of at this point, right, where we're like, all right, I went to the protests, I got my sign, you know, and when my, we start my Zoom, asking- My Zoom background my Zoom with background, all the books looks good. My Zoom background. But still, when we start asking questions about what has shifted, folks go, <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I was at the protests and I gave money, that's enough. Now it's on you people, get to work. What I love about this is it's like a very interesting way of being personal with the work that you're doing. And it doesn't actually require you, right, to like announce your allegiances or all the things you don't know. And I actually kind of find that one of the reasons that people don't want to do the work is because they're scared of messing up. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're scared of making mistakes, right? You're like, I'm gonna say something wrong. If I go too into it, you know, I let my guard down a little bit, I'm gonna use the wrong term, and then I'm gonna be outcast, and then people are gonna drag me on social media, wherever you are. So talk to me a little bit about that piece. Like, how do we understand um, anti-racist work as making a bunch of mistakes? <laughs> I mean, I, I love that description of it. You know, I, I think I might, work that into how we talked okay. about it a little more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, it, it, it is, it should be making a bunch of mistakes. And then the best thing that you can do with a mistake is to make it and then to understand that you made it and then to repair whatever harm was done, whoever or whatever was harmed, and then to figure out how to do it better next time. Like that's how we grow and how we you know, move on. And like, you're not going to know, you know look, Someone asked earlier in an interview that we did, you know, why is it so hard for white people to talk about race? And there's a lot of reasons, I think. But I think a core reason is that we're just not taught to. Like, no one showed us how or told us how. There's not a lot of models for how to talk honestly and openly about it. And so we're figuring it out. And, and that means we're going to mess up. <laughs> um, but again, when you stop after that first time that you say the wrong thing, or if you, if you stop because you're just so anxious about getting it wrong, you're not going to figure it out. It's like literally anything that you're trying to get better at. No one picks up the ball of yarn and the, those n needles and like makes a scarf, mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> including myself. And I've actually really tried. Correct. But like, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. You know? but like it takes, you have to keep trying, um, you know, and it's, it's, that's, and we talk about that in the book, you know, what to do when you mess up. Um, yeah. You have to keep working at it. Yeah. I mean, I think so much of the issue is also that many of us, especially of a, of a certain age, not the, you know, maybe not the, the uh, Gen Z kids, but uh, if you're white, you were taught racism wasn't, a, wasn't your problem. Mm. That's black folks' problem. Mm. Man, they, ha they had a lot of racism happen to them mm. over there. Mm. And they, they're, they're working on it. Then they had that guy give that speech. Uh -uh. Then they had that president. Not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Not that guy. And then it's a problem that's over there. And I think one of the, one of the best things, that I, one of the best expressions that I heard was uh, Pastor Michael McBride from mm. the Bay. It's all going to be references to the Bay. Said that white people have to stop reaching for whiteness too. Mm. 
that the idea of being like you're regularly reaching for your whiteness as okay. a shield, as a way, as a way to as a way to get exclude privilege, as a way to get something, as a way to sort of move through the world, and you're not even aware of it mm -hmm. and until you're aware of it. And that's what the book is also. It starts with like one of the early exercises is called check your privilege. Mm -hmm which it's like, look through, look at yourself, what privileges do you have? And some of those are skin privileges, but some of those are like, do you have a strong Wi-Fi signal at your house? Mm -hmm. Like we learned during the pandemic, that's a privilege. Mm -hmm. That you could be on those Zoom calls or have eight people in your house all on your Wi-Fi because mm -hmm. you got the good package. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so the idea being that like, there's ways in which I think white people have been, have been acculturated and also, exactly, very <laughs> few of us have, were taught an accurate appropriate history of this country that's very right. few of us that's right and so and so that's that's a, you know now i think so many of us at school they weren't teaching us the accurate history and then we get home and our family would be like like my mom would be like what did they tell you right no 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 <laughs> yeah, i know mom's was <laughs> yeah, yeah for sure my mom was definitely like no 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 she no was no like no. now listen sit yeah. down yeah, yeah yeah she would do that for my african-american history class what did she tell you mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So the idea being that like many of us were not taught, many of us across the, across the board were not taught an accurate history of this country. And mm -hmm. so, so you don't even know how bad it is. That's so right. you think that slavery thing, maybe the Native Americans, but you don't realize the depth of how bad it is. Like That's for, right. I keep referencing this episode because I always reference the thing I saw last, I'm that guy. But like, to me, one of, like when you find out that like, okay, na genocide Native Americans, that's bad. But then, they, but then American government made treaties with Native Americans. And then you ask, well, how many treaties did the American government keep of the ones they made? Zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's like, you thought the, that was bad, that, the, the genocide was bad, then everything that happened after it was also bad. That's and I think right. that's, we're not really even at the depth. And that's, so this is why I'd say for the book, there's a lot of like, you may, be a, you may be somebody who has a job as an activist, you may be, you may be every day working in anti-racism. I believe there are things in here, whether it's facts or ways of talking about it, that you may be, like you said, that you're able to go, oh, I can use this. Yep. And we encourage you to use it and make copies of it, and copyrights be damned. Yep. So, yep. You know. and, and actually, I want to add, so to go back to what you said about the, the Black Lives Matter, and, and thank you mm. for that. Mm. I just want to like very publicly thank you <laughs> for everything you've done, right? I, and, you know, and, and the putting above signs, like our book, the first thing that happens when you open this book is your first assignment is there's a poster that says end white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And it's a pull out poster with a little perforated line. And that's your first assignment. And I want to say that when we were first putting the book together, the, book, the sign was going to say Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm at first mm -hmm. and we were like you know what like again where we live we see that sign a lot yep. and we were like let's yep. let's take it up a notch that's right um yeah, and if, is, there, is there a new sign because <laughs> that one seems pretty safe yeah. now and and then we have a note on the back the back of this is like okay here's your assignment put this up somewhere public etc cetera, etc cetera. and also really that's not shit. like yeah. that's just a sign yep. uh and now that sign is your reminder of the that's work right. that you're gonna do but but i I like this also because, like you said, you know, the all the arguing, the equivocation with black, like, like what are you going to say? Don't end white? Well, you don't agree? Yeah. Okay. Then don't put up the sign. But That's if you right. agree, then like, That's here you right. go. We got you a sign. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because so much of how we talk about race and racism, if and when we talk about it, is about people being mean to each other. Right? So when you talk about being anti-racist, people, oh, well, of course I'm anti-racist. I'm not mean. I'm a really nice guy. I'm a really nice person. People like me. My family likes me. They still talk to me. You know, I wave at people on the street. I just don't believe that, um, you know, that uh, black people uh, should be able to vote freely. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm very nice. But I'm, but I'm very, nice, very person. nice. I'm a good person. I'm very nice. I just don't think you people should participate. Right? The internet tells me that there's been a lot of, sc a lot of scandals. A with lot of scams. I mean, you're handing out food. What's yeah, next? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, shout out to Brian Kemp. Uh, so, uh, I, I <laughs> yeah, I said it. I'm new here. I can say maybe something a shout, like that. Maybe a shout down of Brian Kemp. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I want to um, do a few things here. Number one, I want to do a quick lightning round mm -hmm. because we're going to put this whole do the work to the test. Y'all ready for that? Oh my God. Okay. Y'all ready? Stretch. Okay, now I get to be Steve Harvey. Okay. You ready? <laughs> Man, Shout out that, to Steve. That pays well. You know mm -hmm. what? He's looking good these days. He's I've been in a lot of hotels lately. I'm watching a lot of Family Feud, so you know I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm Put me it. in, Final Feud. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. You ready? Yeah. 
defund the police or refund the police? <laughs> <laughs> I had De- to. Defund the police. Sorry. I'm sorry. We need to consult. We're going to go, go with defund. We definitely have different answers. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. going to go with defund the Can we go with abolish? <laughs> what <laughs> happened? I mean, wasn't that like the devil's prayer like a year ago? They were mm-hmm. like, oh my God, defund the police. But as soon as like Trump gets run up on, now yeah. we need to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Defund, defund, defund the, the FBI. FBI? Yeah. Defund yeah. the FBI. I'm like, the they've thing. suddenly lost faith. Yeah. Yo, I feel back, like. Back the blue. What dude. Happened to back the blue. I feel like I'm in the time of Mao. I'm like, this <laughs> is wild. Okay. That was an inside joke. Uh, flats or drums? We're in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Drums. Okay. Flats. Right answer. <laughs> I can do that too. All right, you ready for this? Oh, no, we have people are like, they were like, we're bringing up minute. couples out there. I know. <laughs> Did you say flats, honey? I didn't know. <laughs> Drums? <laughs> Who are you? I mean, the correct answer is it depends on where they're from, but we'll That's come back deep. to that at some other point. Diversity, equity, inclusion, or anti-racist? Anti-racist. Anti-racist. Boom. Yeah, I get mad yeah. right here even the mm-hmm. idea of that. <laughs> don't worry about. Don't worry about that baby can make his. I mean, it's your podcast. I should say that. But <laughs> no. People, okay. People have babies. I've I've read in my Shout life. Shout out to the babies. I had. I and didn't have three. I assisted in. Adorable three. yellow bow. I'm in love with you. You're so yeah. cute. Yes. Ah. Hey. Ah. All right. We're surrounded. Boston Tea Party or January 6th insurrection? (laughs) 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 Can we go with John Brown? (laughs) We can't. can't. Harper's Ferry. Between those two, I guess, Boston Tea Party, I guess, yeah. I guess. I mean, the idea of the Boston Tea Party was good. I don't know if they they were thinking about black folks, but yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. (laughs) No taxation without representation, and then we built the country. Yo. <laughs> taxation without lots of representation. I mean, it's a whole thing. No taxation without representation, but gerrymandering and packing and cracking <laughs> and their electoral college. But then, no taxation totally. without representation. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, tell us a story about how y'all even came to do this. Like, this whole, co- this whole book is a conversation between them. And honestly, when you read it, you're going to feel like you're just sitting in between them going like this. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So... Where did the idea even come from for it to be in this kind of form? Mm. I still believe, and I, it's, I'm pretty sure it's true, right? Like we both had the idea for a workbook. Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 the origin story, we've known each other for a long time. We've been friends, again, as we've yeah. mentioned like 80 billion times so far. Everything happens in the Bay. We've known each other in the East Bay for a long time. In the he, same way that like we all know each other. Yeah, like, we're all mutual the, fans. You're all in the same circles. You're all fans of each other's work. You show up at the same galas or nonprofits mm-hmm. or rallies or I protests. I don't go to galas. I don't know why I said galas. I wouldn't even go to a gala. But uh, I, I, I've seen you would go to a gala. I would. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you, But you're in the, the same fashion. sort of like, oh, there's a there's a fundraiser for, oh, look, you're here. Oh, you're, I'm speaking after you. There's yeah. just a sort of a, and then you get to hang out, you know. Yeah. So in the wake of the murder of George Floyd at the end of May 2020, Kamau sent me an email that literally said, help me with these white people. And it said, I am you know, all these white people of, and he said, not just regular whites, but the like important whites. I might have said the fancy whites. The fancy whites, the fancy whites, whites. are coming to him and asking, what can I do? <laughs> That's how it felt too. Yeah. That's really actually how it felt. That was all over my phone. Like, yeah. are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so he said, can you help me? Can you help me with these white people? And I said, yes. Send me your white people, like, let's talk. Um, and then he took it very literally, and a few days later texted me. And I was driving with my kid in the car. I got a text from him. I was on 880 near downtown Oakland. Yes. And the text said, I'm going on Conan O'Brien in 10 minutes. Can you talk? And I was like, oh, well, of course I can, Kamau. Let me just pull over in downtown Oakland, which is boarded up because there's been people in the streets every night That's since right. the murder of George Floyd. That's right. uh, and let's have a brainstorm with my kids screaming in the back seat. Yep. And we talked, and we talked, I mean, about what, what do you say to Conan O'Brien that you haven't already said to a million other people? Yeah, because that people. week after, the week after George Floyd, a couple weeks after George Use Floyd. Use your mic, player. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. For a couple weeks after George Floyd was... For that couple, for that couple weeks after George Floyd was murdered, like every talk show was trying to get all the black people to come on and talk about racism. I had never seen so many black people on TV. As no, they did it was, and it was in like, and it was sort of like, I mean, and great, but also it was like I felt like I'd done enough of them before I, 
by the time I called her that I was like, I was sort of tired of having the same conversation yeah. where they sort of like have the like, just talk to me about it. Yeah. And I would talk and they'd be like, yeah, that's bad. And so I was like, what can I do with Conan that is different than having the same conversation? Yeah. And one of the things you said, I don't know if you remember, was like, can you ask him a question? Mm. And I was like, oh, I never even thought about that before. <laughs> and so I, the, the, uh, the question basically was like, what can you do? Mm. Instead of like, instead of, because I think there was a lot of like, it's time for the conversation. And Kate was like, no, no, it's time for action. Mm -hmm. we've, we've already had the time for the conversation. Yeah. And so it became about like putting it back on him and saying, we need you to do more. It's you're a person of all this privilege. How many black people do you have on your staff? Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And that, that conversation, our brainstorm for the conversation, my conversation with Conan, it became clear like, oh, we should like, there's something here we can do. Mm. Yeah. And he said, let's write a book. And why would I say no to that? It was the pandemic. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not going to be going on the road for a long time. Yeah. Because CNN wouldn't put me out there in the streets with no vaccine. Mm -mm. They don't care about you like that. And then we had <laughs> I'm not a, Anderson. And then we had a Zoom brainstorm. And we literally both said, what about an activity book? And mm. I thought that was a ridiculous idea. Mm. It, is, it actually is a ridiculous, is a ridiculous idea. idea, but he had it too. And again, that really comes from, we were also home with our kids. Yeah. Um, so we both have, we both have young kids. Yeah. Our kids weren't in school. We were seeing them on Zoom every day, watching teachers try to figure out how to teach them and keep them engaged. Um, they all have these activity books, the, the brain quest books that yeah. keep them, f keeps their brains fresh. So it was like, nothing else is working. Like what other angle do we take to get at people and how do we get them actually engaged with this material? and you know, let's just go back to elementary school and I do some games. This. I mean, to so, me, it's also the thing, like every adult who takes a kid to the dentist and sees Highlight Magazine mm -hmm. picks it up. That's right. You're like, let's see what Goofus and Galan are That's up right. to these days. <laughs> That's right. Like there's a natural sort of pull towards activities. We're a gamified culture. Everybody's got games on their phones. So I think right. it, like, it, it's a ridiculous idea that makes sense in the current environment. It's just the, the idea that anti-racism would come through this way, which is why it was like, we need to make sure it's as our was it, it's funny, but it's not fucking around. That's right. Ooh, funny, but not fucking around. Yeah, that's our that's our unofficial tag. That they wouldn't let us put it on the to cover. Be a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, oh, why not? Why okay, not? anyways, yeah. um, I got one or two more questions, and while I'm gathering my questions, you gather yours because mm. you're gonna get a chance to ask them. Um, I love this activity section called Know Your Lane. Mm. It's so good, and let me tell you why. I think one thing that really keeps people from getting involved is they think they have to do a thing that they don't have to do, mm -hmm. right? Like you assume, right? Okay, well, I'm only, I can only be effective if I'm like in the streets or if I have all the language or blah, blah, blah. Tell me about, this is so good. Tell me about this section and why you all decided to include it in here, getting well, to know your lane for that exact reason, that I think a lot of people think, okay, I wanna do something, I wanna make a change, and they have this idea that activism is something that they're not, that it's a new thing you have to do, um, that you have to become something else, and that activism looks and sounds like a certain thing, and then maybe that's like being in the streets and leading the protest or starting a nonprofit, or basically reinventing the wheel and doing something outside of what already exists in your life. So. We wanted to get at that. Again, every idea that we had for this book, we were like, okay, how do we make a game out of it? You know, how do we make it playful? So we thought of the phrase of people saying like, just stay in your lane, yeah. which is kind of like often used as a diss. Like, okay, you know, you're doing too much. Mm -hmm. Stay in your lane, mm -hmm. like stay over there. And, it's, right. and so our idea was actually your lane is incredibly powerful. Like you can have the most impact in the lane that you're already in. You don't have to do something entirely new. So we made the activity and it's got a bunch of questions where you're looking at like, what, is, what are your lanes? We all have them. It's like, it's where you work, it's your neighborhood. If you're a parent, it's like, you know, all your mom friends. Yeah. It's your community, it's your church, right? It's your family. So like, where's white supremacy showing up? Because it's 100% showing up in all those lanes somehow. What are you already doing? What, and then what power do you have in that lane? Because I think that's part of it is that we often have more power than we think that we do, right? Like maybe, we, maybe we're not out in the streets, maybe we don't know a bunch of activists, but you have some pull and some influence on some folks in your world. So who are those people? Who do you know? What are your resources? And what do you do within that space? I love that. All right. Y'all got questions? Oh, this is very special. Um, I just want to say that we don't usually let people come to the microphone. I this know, me neither, because you know, it could so be dangerous. That means there's a lot of pressure. So here's, uh, we just request that at least ends with a question sound. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> For real, though. For real, though. Hi. It's a real question. Yeah. I've been doing the press for 30 years. I'm chanting this book. 
Yes. Years ago. Okay. Great. My question is, you touched on education a bit. I have 10 grandkids. They're all going back to school right now. Come through. And how do you now think about the challenge they have, the teachers have, in teaching concepts that relate to diversity, to equity, to inclusion, uh, in an environment where those kind of things are not taboo mm. in the classroom, books are being banned, and so forth. Mm. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And I met, him in the par- I met him in the parking lot, right? That's what's yeah. up. Should yes. we take your question, too? I want to make sure you get in. Yep. No, yes. Ask. Yes, please. No, yeah. That's all right. Okay. We can think we can about both. Um, uh, I've really uh, come around to see the importance of reparations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, when I bring it up to my liberal white friends, they think I'm talking about aliens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, every every black person in the room appreciates that question. <laughs> Every, whatever everybody's you like, do, everybody's what like, come talk to me. Let's talk. Whatever to you. you do, do not show them Donald Glover's episode oh, from the last episode. season of Atlanta on reparations. That's gonna freak your friends out. <laughs> but it's really funny. Oh my god. Okay. Okay. So reparations, and then how are we education. dealing with the climate, the education yeah. climate, and how can this be useful? Um, well, thank you both. I mean, God, maybe we should take audience questions more. No, this, is are, yeah, this is special. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're used to the Bay Area where everybody that gets up, it's like, it's. Uh, I have less of a question and more of a comment. Correct. And then it's like a thing. Correct. <laughs> or it's like, it starts with like, uh, I have to start in 1922. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, no, but first, sir, thank thank you for teaching, oh, doing diversity work for thirty years. Thank you for that. Yeah, right? shout out. Before, you know, b- before that was before that was work that was done in most spaces. Um, so one thing I'll say about um, about in terms of education and children. Um, good news: we're writing um, another book. This, yes. We're writing the second book, a follow up to this that is aimed at young people. Um, and the biggest thing that's going to be different about that book is so this book is meant for you to write in and tear pages out and take out the posters and their stickers. Um, that means that this book can't be in libraries because you ca- uh, libraries won't, won't carry books like that. So for our young people's version, we're gonna tweak it. So uh, because for accessibility and for the exact reasons you're talking about, it's really important that our next book be in libraries, both public school libraries and our public library system because that is how you get books to young people. Um, and I think the thing that we've been saying about this book too when it comes to this is, you know, a lot of people have said, well, we've got to teach the young kids this. And it's like, yes, we absolutely do. But it's the grown-ups are the ones that really need this. And that's who we're getting at with this. You know, I mean, there's, it's not the kids out there that are trying to ban the books. They're ahead <laughs> like, of us. Yeah, they know what's up. They're like, um, can y'all not drive us off a cliff, please? Yeah. We're like, mm, we'll think about it. And so one hope I have, I mean, I hope that there's some p- teachers who maybe are teaching in those environments where books are being banned and when they're, where they're be- their curriculum is being restricted, maybe that they can, I mean, you gotta get sneaky in situations like this. And I think our book is sneaky. Yeah. So maybe they can kind of bring in some of the activities in here, you know, in the classroom. That'd be great. That'd and be it also, I think it, it puts it back on, I think this, like I said, this book, like we said, this book is for grownups. And the idea being that like, you can do what my mom did. If your kid comes home and tells you, did you know that many of the slaves actually enjoyed it? You can be like, ha ha ha. <laughs> Come sit down. <laughs> Instead of going, which a lot of parents do, really? I didn't know that. You I know, that you don't have the ability to have the conversation. I think it's important that as parents, we have the ability to have those conversations with our kids because, especially if you're a black parent, which otherwise is negligence. Yeah. And then the one other thing I, was, I would add to that is if you are someone who lives in a school district or a community where there is a lot of where the book bans are happening, where these school board meetings are happening, show up. Um, and if you don't live in one of those communities, but you know people that do, encourage them to show up. Vol- you know, and whether the, uh, that's whether you know going to the school board meetings and also speaking, but volunteering in schools, volunteering in school libraries, being a presence, showing up. Because those folks that are doing that, they're showing up, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they're really organized. Yeah. That's, you know, and, and like I give them credit for absolutely nothing, but I will give them credit for organizing and That's for right. showing up. Right. And so for those of us who are really concerned about how to stop that and turn that tide, we also had to figure out how to be active and how to be present. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And I also feel like I have to shout out Donors Choose, which is an organization I'm on the board of directors of, which helps teachers raise money for class projects. And it's another way, if you can, and if you don't have the money to, to support it, you can also just spread the word and have other people support it. I mean, a lot of times those projects can be done for less than $100. And yes. you, can, you and your crew can all come together and put five on it. And, it's, and a lot of those teachers, you can look under equity focus, and it's, t it's classrooms that are majority students of color and black students and indigenous students, so you can support classrooms where maybe they are, they are behind. So I would say that that's, there's, and we have a thing in here, it's, it's called uh, Donation Bingo, which teaches you how to donate your money most effectively. Mm. Sometimes when I get really depressed, I just go on Donors Choose and like send 50 bucks to a teacher in a city really yeah. far away from me. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like I did something. Important. Um, reparations. Reparations. Yes, thank you for that question. You don't want to go and let that slide. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I, well, because what I hear in that question, what I really appreciate is that it's also just a question of I've got something that I really believe in and care about that seems crazy to most of the people I know. How do I talk to them about it, mm -hmm. right? And 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 like it could be reparations, it could be other things, but it's like how do I start that? It, I, it made me think. I have a, my friend Wendy. Uh, this is, again, another Bay Area thing. I have a friend named Wendy. She's a white woman, white mom. You meet her. She's like the most normal, nice white mom. And she works with the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Yes, and she'd be out there selling pies. Yes. She'd be out there selling yes. pies in Oakland talking about reparations mm -hmm. every weekend. Mm -hmm. And she was so gentle and sweet and like a mom friend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she would just kind of be like, well, hey, I'm selling pies if you want to come by. And you know, oh, I hope you like your pie. Also, if you ever want to talk about reparations, let me know. <laughs> and I was like, and I just, there was something about, not that you have to sell pies, but like, there's, a, there's ways in to get to these conversations where it's not just like, let's talk about reparations, right? But there's like ways to bring it in. Maybe it's like you see a documentary that you recommend to people or you get, find an article that you like share. Uh, what do you want to add to that? I would say like one of the things I've learned from United States of America is actually if you're going to have conversations with people that are that difficult, you have to let them talk and not pull back from their talking. Mm -hmm. So like you have to go, hey, your friend who's afraid of reparations, I don't know, let's call him uh, uh, Cletus. I don't know. Cletus. Uh, <laughs> I just pulled the name. Uh, hey, Cletus, what are you afraid of? And then you got to sit there and listen to it. And a lot of it's going to be nonsense. But you have to sit there and if this is a friend, a person you want to have a relationship with, the person that you want to continue a relationship with, you got to let them sort of the circus is in town, I sound like a clown. And then when they get to the end of it, there will be something in there that you can go, this thing you said is actually incorrect. Or this thing you said, I have a response for. There's going to be some way for you to engage, but it really is about... I think we want to be able to like, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but a lot of times in these situations, you're like, you want to, what's the link I can send them so they can stop being this way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's not that link that I, very few things have changed for the betterment of the world in one conversation. Mm -hmm. Or one link. Or one link, <laughs> yeah. And really it's about like, and I think it's also, I mean, and maybe you've done this, it's also about if you have a lot of information about ref reparations, then you can meet them where they're at. So then if they're like, well, I just don't want, I don't want the check coming out of my, you know, the federal government has lots of money that it spends on lots of things every year. We are sending boatloads of money to Ukraine right now. Listen, we just make up money. We d and we just print it. We actually do just print it. When we, so they, we, it doesn't, so stop being afraid of it coming out of your paycheck and start thinking about how are we spending resources in ways that we can spend them better. So I think that's the other thing. The more you can sort of like take in the reparations information so that you can meet people where they're at, so you can dismantle their arguments, I think is the other thing too. But I think really a lot of it's like, if these are your friends, because you know, your presence is also a present you give to someone, mm. and if these are your friends and you want to give them the presence of your present, of the, pres the present of your presence, then you have to listen to it. And the thing that can happen sometimes, you can say, hey, Cletus, every time we talk about reparations, you go off the blah, blah, blah. I'm going to stop hanging out. And often you're, and sometimes in those, they'll be like, oh, maybe I need to start, start listening to this person because I don't want them to remove themselves from my life. So in other words, maybe he should actually watch Donald Glover's episode. <laughs> <laughs> because, for those of you who haven't seen it, see it. It's actually excellent because it really is all of white people's worst fears about reparations in a comedic yeah. format. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is a good opening to say, okay, so actually none of these things would happen. I think one of the things I would say too is also people don't know that the, that the government has paid reparations before. Yeah. I think that's the other thing people don't realize is that it's not, it wouldn't be the first time. It but not to be, black people. It would, yeah, it wouldn't be the second time. The, one of my favorite stories of reparations is it paid in DC, 
it paid reparations to slave owners for what they for lost losing, for, for losing, losing, <laughs> for losing their property. You know what? You took their tractors. I can't, I, Thank you. I, I like that healthy laugh. Yeah. That, okay. So I mean, we have we have not we have paid reparations. I think a lot of people think that that would be the first time in forever. It's you know not. what? <laughs> Do we have five more minutes, library homies? Sure. Okay, great. Because uh, it's time for the weekly roundup. Ooh. We're gonna do it quick because this week was kind of boring in terms of news, but Wait, was one, it? it was. Isn't it just Tuesday? Yeah, it is, but. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's coming. You know, I, be, I, you know, started. I, I, I gotta record these things on Tuesdays. Okay, so okay. according to me, the okay. week has been boring. Okay. So uh, the NBA this week announced that it was shutting down games on election day so that folks can vote. This is something that Lady loves. Uh, this was the NBA Social Justice League who announced this week that there would be no, and I mean no, games on election day in order to encourage people to go and vote. Now, Lady 100% loves this idea. Now, if we could only do something about that pesky voter suppression keeping people from the polls, Kate, Kamau, what say you? Do you think we could have the NBA sit down with Brian Kemp and all them people and tell them, hey, could y'all get it all the way together? We're doing our part. Now it's time for you to do yours, or is there something else we I can mean, do? I mean, here's what I would say. If, if we could get, I mean, I guess I would sacrifice. If, if Brian Kemp, who's, first of all, in his last days in office, mm. um, can commit to, like, letting whoever, letting, letting people who are, who are legitimately supposed to vote and able to vote go to vote? Which is almost everybody. Almost everybody. If he, would, if he would just allow those people to vote, then I would trade him Steph Curry for the season. <laughs> <laughs> just for the season. Just for the season. Uh, okay. It's Brian Kemp for Steph Curry. <laughs> it's Brian Kemp for Steph Curry. I, 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 I am friends with Steve Kerr. I'll have to talk to him about it. But, uh, but yeah, I would. Steve. I would yeah. Steve's like, come Steve. out. Yeah, I know, I know. If he hears you this, you're gonna, talking wild. <laughs> Uh, I'll add, uh, that's great. Thank you, NBA. I'd also like to see them stepping up uh, in the fight to bring Brittany Griner home. Uh, yeah. And yeah. let's also see the, w the NBA not just, not just speaking up about that, but about pay equity and what we can do to support the WNBA. Hello. Hello. Uh, get those women the pay they deserve, the treatment they deserve on and off the courts. Hello. Thank you. Also, can we, um, and this is my statement, me, Alicia Garza, yes. can we elect B. Wen for Secretary of State? So I co-sign that. I co-sign that. Pesky rules that try to keep people from the polls to mm -hmm. basically make decisions over our own lives. You know, yeah. no big deal. Yeah. Okay, other things that happened <laughs> this week. Biden signs the Inflation Reduction Act, which they have now just started calling healthcare, climate, and stuff. <laughs> uh, we talked about this on the podcast last week, but it's worthwhile to say that it's looking like Finally, Democrats are getting in the ring and law passing for their lives. Yeah, yeah. The bill stands to provide the largest investments in climate resilience ever, taxes corporations so that they pay their fair share, and allows the feds to negotiate prices for prescription drugs. It also encourages the IRS to go after tax dodgers. Hopefully, that's the rich ones and not the people who just can't pay. Mm -hmm. Kate, Kamal, let me ask you this. Is it going to be enough? What can people in this audience do to make sure we keep the momentum going? Ooh. I, I think this, is, I don't know if that's this audience specifically, but I would say Democrats as a whole have to stop being so protective of Joe Biden. He's just, he's do, he, huh, he, huh, don't be, no, he, uh, there's a thing that happens that if you're on the, on the left and you say, I think Joe Biden needs to do more, that suddenly people come after you because it's like, stop being so hard oh, on know. him. <laughs> or just like, or just be grateful he's not Trump. Yeah. And I think the more that we—that's our standard. Yeah, that's that's really too low. Even my 11-year-old daughter this week was like, she said this morning, "I just think Biden should be doing more." I agree, Shout Sammy. Out to you. I agree, Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to I didn't know she. I didn't know she'd identify herself. But yeah, and that's because she, she. So I think that we have to be comfortable going. Great. What what else she got? Yeah, yeah. Is it enough? No. Yeah. Is it something? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Let's do more. And I think the thing I'm gonna keep saying is, okay, again, apparently it's Tuesday. I'm pretty sure it's August. <laughs> uh, Correct. What our audience can do is get involved now um, for midterm elections. Mm -hmm. if, if electoral politics is your thing, if you care about who's getting elected, if you care about what happens, if you wanna help build political power um, in this country, in the state, but also locally, um, the time to get really excited and involved uh, in 
uh, making sure people can vote, uh, making sure they vote for the right folks. The time is actually like last week, last month. Um, so it's now. It's not like the last week of October to suddenly m do your volunteer thing for the election. It's now. Like get, and part get of that fired is, like, up. Reaching out to your people and going, is everybody registered? Because I, I know. Y'all need a ride? Is the date already happened? Because I, I know out here it, cut, ends up, it ends really early. But yeah, making sure, yeah, do you need a ride? Uh, what can I do? And, I, and obviously, you got, you got Fair Fight here, you got New Georgia Project, New Georgia Project Action Fund there. You, if you call them up and say, what can I do? They're going to have a list of activities for you to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, y'all. That's it for our incredible program tonight. Please join me in thanking and appreciating for doing the work. W. Kamau Bell and Kate Schatz. Thank you. Thank you to the Auburn Research Library for hosting us. Thank you for Chair's Books. For making sure that there's books, there will be books that are available for you. So if you don't have your copy, go get it. They're all signed. And that's also it for Lady Don't Take No. We appreciate you joining us. Kate, Kamal, tell the people who are listening how they can follow you and your incredible work on the socials. Mm, I'm at Kate Schatz on uh, the Instagram and the Twitter. I'm at Debbie Kamal Bell on the Instagram and the Twitter. Mm, there I you love go. it. Yeah. I love it. And don't worry about what I'm on. You can find me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. It's been wonderful. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.